Hey guys, welcome back to Out of Left Field. Graham and Chris here with you. The gang is back together. Chris back from his uh, birthday weekend last weekend, although his birthday is today. Happy birthday, my friend. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, I don't feel any older, but... You look horrendous. You know, I guess that... Well, I always look horrendous. I don't know what else. <laughs> so, good to have you back. You were in... Uh, you were on the... California Beach, if I remember correctly. Was it Monterey? I was. I was in Monterey. Uh, easily the prettiest part of California. Um, I took my wife there. We actually weren't celebrating my birthday. We were celebrating our anniversary a little bit early because our anniversary is in March, and March is, of course, going to be insane for the both of us. So yes. went down, celebrated our ninth wedding anniversary. I had a great time. Did some whale watching, saw some whales. It's a good time. I, I wasn't in California. And there's self-deprecating humor for today. Right. So, <laughs> uh, I'm a little funny thing about, about uh, well, hey, you know, I know you went, uh, I know you went to um, uh, to the San Francisco Giants ballpark. And funny thing, you happened to be near San Francisco, had a chance to go uh, by the park. And our guest today is Major League Baseball umpire Hunter Wendelstadt, who worked his first World Series two years ago when the Royals and the Giants played each other. And actually his game behind the plate was in that very park that you visited. So we're very excited to have Hunter joining us here very soon and hope you guys are going to stick around. So that interview should be great uh, as we are about three weeks into uh, umpire school for a couple of hundred uh, young, some older guys, some are umpires that are hoping to get jobs in the minor leagues and make their way into the majors. So uh, we'll talk to him and hear how school's going and get some, uh, some really exciting information from him and some stuff that uh, for you young umpires out there should enjoy. Unfortunately, before we can get to the enjoyment and the fun of that, we, we start the show off with a little bit of, of jest and humor to go ahead and, and actually begin the baseball news kind of somber. So as we put the ball in play really kind of quietly and more on a more of a damper down note, Chris, it came across this morning that uh, Kansas City Royals, really, I mean, firearm, Donna Ventura was killed in a car crash in Dominican Republic, where he is from his home country, this makes two top, top starting pitchers, not saying that they're on the same level here, but two top hurlers in the last, what, four months or so that have passed away due to just tragic circumstances. And we also see that Andy Marte, another former Major League player, died in a car crash in the Dominican Republic, and it was actually two separate incidents, which you and I thought actually were going to be connected until we read deeper into the news coverage. Right. I, it, when I initially saw, I initially saw the Andy Marte report, and I thought, well, that's sad. You know, I mean, Andy Marte was, was a pretty good baseball player, played for the Arizona Diamondbacks last in 2014. And then I get something else comes across my news feed that Jordano Ventura was also killed in a car crash. And the first thing I thought was, they were in the car together. Uh, that was the that was the logical step that my mind took, and I actually had to read the Andy Marte article on ESPN to realize that no, these were two separate incidents. And uh, Jordano Ventura was really good friends with uh, Oscar Tavares, who died in 2014 in a car crash in the Dominican Republic. And that's when Ventura threw his seven-inning shutout against the Giants in Game 6 of the, of the World Series, a game that he dedicated to Tavares. Uh, it's terribly sad to see the news today that Ventura's passed in the same way, that Marte's passed in the same way. And this is a huge loss uh, for baseball, for Latin American baseball players, for the Dominican Republic, and, uh, you know, obviously our thoughts – and condolences go out to their families. Uh, undeniably, I mean, it, it's just it, it kind of mind-boggling how uh, really rocked the baseball world has been in the last, uh, you know, several months. I, I, 
I, I jokingly said, does this mean we're going to have the retirement of another, you know, storied voice of baseball is, you know, right after Jose Fernandez passed was Vince Scully's last game. Uh, you know, so, so hopefully they say things come in threes. I hope it stops now. It's already, you know, too, too many. And let's hope that we don't have any more uh, of these stories to report at all in the near future. I mean, Ventura was a, was a you know, a, uh, a firebrand. You never really knew what you were going to get. He's a guy who kind of like, you know, we, we talked about off the air that uh, you know, saw the good side of baseball. And, and he was also kind of the bad side of baseball. He was involved in, you know, in two benches clearing incidents, one in Chicago, two seasons ago, one in, uh, in, in Baltimore last year, which we discussed early on when you and I began the show, I think our third or fourth week, it was like a string of fights. We had the, we had the Bautista brawl, then right after that, we get, the, uh, we get Machado charging the mound. And one of the things that you and I had discussed, and I want to touch briefly, you know, not, not, not to, to you know, sully his name at all, but, I mean, it, this is a show about the facts of, of baseball and, and, and those who, who participated. Is he, he was beginning to really wane on that organization. That's obviously never going to affect the way that they remember him and honor him because – he will always be a part of that club. He'll always have a ring. You know, it'll always be a family. And a lot of guys in that Royals organization are very close. You see them together. They laugh even on TV. They come and prank each other. But he was a guy who, when that Machado fight happened, and you see Manny Machado start heading towards the mound, Salvador Perez is a big boy. And he did not seem in too big of a hurry to slow Machado down before he got out there and laid a pop onto the head of Giordano Ventura, Chris. Right. And Ventura, Ventura's always been kind of a hothead. Uh, but for him to go after Machado like that, I understand going after guys. We've talked about this ad nauseum on the show, that if you do certain things as a hitter, pitchers are going to do certain things in retaliation. And we're not here to put our opinion out there as some sort of end-all, be-all as to whether or not that's right, wrong, or indifferent. But if you're going to pop a guy, you don't pop a guy at 100 miles an hour. And that's what he did with Machado. He hit Manny Machado at 99 miles an hour in the upper back uh, with a rising fastball. They could very easily have gotten away from him hitting him in the head. You hit a guy in the head with a 100-mile-an-hour fastball, and now you're talking about some serious injuries. So was Machado right to rush the mound? Probably not. Was Ventura right to hit Machado with a 99-mile-an-hour fastball? Definitely not. Um, and, of course, we're not going to sully Ventura's name, as you said. But eventually, when you see a guy who is coming off of a season where he had a seven- or eight-game suspension for hitting a guy, then turns around and gets suspended nine games for hitting Machado, you got to think maybe – at some point, if Machado rushes the mound and punches Ventura, well, Salvador Perez probably thinking to himself, well, he kind of earned that. I mean, he hit the guy pretty <laughs> he had hard. had that one coming. Exactly. And if Machado's going to come out there and, and give him a little bit of that medicine back, then maybe I'm just going to hold back. If it gets crazy, I'll run out there. If he takes a bat with him, I'll run out there. Right. But... Uh, yeah, he did have some problems, but overall, he was a pretty good pitcher. He was a strikeout guy. Uh, through 470 strikeouts, he was a 2-1 to one strikeout to walk guy. Um, averaged just over, or just under eight strikeouts per nine innings pitched. And the nice thing is the guy didn't give up long balls almost, almost at all. He less than one nine, well, less than one home run. Per nine, per nine innings, uh, which is a pretty incredible number. Even yeah, well, especially yeah. for a guy who, who went 11 and 12 in his final season uh, in 100 Yeah, he had a rough year, and, you know, I, I think we're all hoping for a bounce back year from him, and, and unfortunately, um, you know, we're not going to see that. So, you know, may, may he rest in peace. And as you said, you know, prayers and condolences to his family and teammates, and, um, you know, I'm sure that they will, uh, they will honor him throughout the season. Uh, moving on to something a little bit, uh, I guess, kind of, uh, to be fair, on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, uh, if you try to kind of, you know, boost the, the morale a little bit, is 
while while unfortunately one team has to deal with the loss of someone very close, another team deals with the induction of three more members of their family. Jeff Bagwell, Tim Raines, and Pudge Rodriguez uh, finally made it in to the Baseball Hall of Fame. Now, I know we broke these guys down uh, probably ad nauseum to some of our our listeners, and we thank you guys for sticking with us. If you didn't catch our breakdowns, you can always find them at OO Left Field on Twitter, and Out of Left Field hosted by Chris and Graham on Facebook. All of our shows are there, including our new YouTube video. We have a new YouTube video up uh, with some stuff on the Hall of Fame, guys, as well as some audio and interviews with uh, with um, some guys from the Diamond Resorts Invitational. That was really enjoyable. Mark DeRosa, as well as Hall of Fame pitcher John Smoltz joined me, and he gives his thoughts on these guys, especially Trevor Hoffman, who battled those I mean, we're talking 1% short. I mean, one of, one of the worst, you know, coming up so close. It's kind of like getting that save in the World Series and like Mariano Rivera, you know, that, that one blooper goes over your head and, and you lose it. But we see, you know, I think one of the, the, the greatest catcher of a generation in Pudge Rodriguez gets in on the first ballot, just over 75% of the vote. And then Tim Ring on his 10th and final season makes it in with 86%. And Bagwell's goes two tenths of a percent higher. Um, the one I, I think, think you're going to hate the most is that Clemens and Bonds gained ten percent of of votes, and no player with more than half sure. of their ballot life left has not been inducted over fifty percent of the vote. Sure, uh, Bonds and Clemens did did gain uh, did did in from their perspective they gained pretty well, and to be at fifty percent from. I think just under 40% actually uh, at one point is, I mean, good for them. You know how I feel about the hall of fame. Basically baseball is going to have to make a decision. Is the hall of fame a shrine to great players or is the hall of fame a museum? And if the baseball hall of fame is a shrine to great players, those two players don't get in. But if it's just a museum, then yeah, they do. Um, And, if that's what they want it to be, then that's what they want it to be, and I have no problem with that. Just make sure that that's what it is. As far as Pudge Rodriguez, his, his ties to PEDs are tangential at best. You know how I feel about him. I, I went off on about how I feel about him. I'm not going to talk about that anymore. Congratulations to Pudge Rodriguez. Congratulations to Jeff Bagwell, obviously. Tim Raines, a guy who was deserving a decade ago. Uh, and is finally seeing that come to fruition. I'm glad Tim Raines got in. And as far as Trevor Hoffman, it's hard, man, because Trevor Hoffman is 1% away of ballots, which I think in the long run is about four votes. I, I think it's three or four because he like uh, three and a half he votes, received right? 327 votes, and Pudge got 336. Pudge had 76%. And Hoff had three, had seventy four percent, so it's right about the three thirty three thirty one mark. Right. So that's hard, you know, that to to miss it by three or four votes is is rough. But that comes from the sentiment that you've heard guys in the past say, you know, I'm not going to vote in a specialist type closer until Mariano Rivera is on the ballot. So that being said, I think that next year might be Trevor Hoffman's shot at the Hall of Fame. Uh, Rivera comes in in 2018. He'll be on the ballot. And uh, 19. 19. Right. Sorry, he following gets, the... Yeah, yeah he, gets, he, gets, he gets five calendar years of retirement, then he comes on. So this gives Hoffman one final chance to make it on before the greatest closer of all time makes his mark, and then Hoffman's going to have to sit at least a year once Rivera makes the ballot, I think. Right. And I think that if... If Trevor Hoffman doesn't make it next year, it's kind of a crime because we're talking about the guy, talking about a guy who was first to 500, first to 600. Yes, Mariano Rivera eclipsed his total, but only by about 50 games and or 50 shuts. So to say that Mariano Rivera is deserving and Trevor Hoffman, who was the first to hit that 600 number, is not deserving, it's a little ridiculous to me. I'd like to see him get in next year before Mariano Rivera. Although next year is going to be a, a big ballot too. I mean, you're going to have guys like uh, Roy Halladay coming on, uh, who's probably going to go in first round. 
Um, there's, we looked at it, what, seven or eight guys that we thought could prob- possibly be first ballot guys. And yeah, I, I mean, there, there's going to be a, a lot of, uh, I mean, I mean that's going to be, that's gonna be the, you know, the tough part coming up here. As we've said multiple times, and we're not going to, you know, get, get too, too deep into it. But yeah, I mean, there's, I think uh, Chipper Jones uh, comes on. Um, you're going to see Jim Tome, who should make it in Andrew Jones, Johnny Damon, probably, you know, I mean, uh, you know, probably won't, but I mean, definitely would, would get some consideration. Chris Carpenter was a great pitcher, uh, you know, in his own right for, for the Cardinals. Uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, quite a few guys who, uh, you know, who are going to have, uh, have their name on there. And it's going to be hard. I definitely think that, that he has earned uh, enshrinement for sure. And especially when you look at, as you, as you were saying, and I think your point, you made a great point without, I think, really even getting as deep into it as I kind of hoped you would. And I want to jump on that is, you know, talk about that, that, that Mo only had maybe 50 saves more right around that, that, that time. He also had a team that won four world championships. Right. Trevor Hoffman didn't. So you're playing on teams who, yeah, you know, maybe they're, they're playing decent, consistent baseball, but nothing to the, to the effect of where you're always going to be in games where you are expecting to contend for games, contend for wins, and you need a guy to come in there and consistently save those games to give you that, that shot. So that, that, to me, even speaks bigger volumes of what Trevor Hoffman can do and why he will make it into the Hall of Fame. So congratulations to those guys. Again, remember, guys, you can check it out, Out of Left Field, hosted by Chris and Graham on Facebook, as well as Out of Left Field, hosted by Chris and Graham on YouTube. So I think maybe we should take a few moments to discuss somebody who's not going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer, and that's Jose Batista, who finally signed a deal with the Toronto Blue Jays this this past uh, what past week, yeah. and uh, took about, about uh, three, three four days ago. And we've been man, we've been waiting for this for four months. I mean, I, I you know he he was he was hard determined to not go to Toronto, and where's he heading back to? Is north of the border, right? And it, he 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 took a bit of a pay cut, um, one year guaranteed at eighteen and a half, plus mutual options for for any time beyond that. Uh, not quite as lucrative in the long run as a qualifying offer might have been, but still he got he got paid, and he's going to be in. Toronto, which is, I think, the only place that he realistically could have gone and been even marginally successful. Hopefully, he does well more akin to what he did in 2015 than what he did in 2016. He didn't exactly have the greatest year last year. He has uh, all of the host of problems that come along with him. So we're going to sit back and kind of look at Batista and say, well, maybe he can get back to 40 home runs. Maybe he can get back to 140 ribbies and maybe he won't hit, you know, 230 for eight. Yeah. Minutes. And one of the odd ones here is actually a, an attendance bonus built into his contract. So in each year he can earn up to $900,000 depending upon how the club draws. He, t- he gets 150,000 for every 100,000 fans through the gate. Uh, between three and a half and four million. So I mean, I mean, so so a, a pretty, it's a kind of an odd um, addendum in there. I wouldn't expect. Uh, and and you bring it up exactly, and it's something that uh, that Mark DeRosa spoke to me about. Is you know, are we going to get the guy who has his leg kicked down and is launching long balls out of the Rogers Center and everywhere he goes, or the guy who's just kind of a mediocre, you know, two twenty hitter who's not doing anything? Uh, you know, and, and really. Let's be honest. You and I both, I think, assumed uh, and, and expected that this was the only logical option. To be honest, the Blue Jays kind of damned him to return. A 38-year-old guy, until that new CBA takes effect, I can't think of any team who was going to see Jose Bautista as being a, 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 a piece that was worth giving up a first-round draft pick for. And with that qualifying offer attached to him, teams were, were going to be forced into that. So I can't think of any team that was going to be willing to give up something that precious. Although, granted, we understand that prospects in baseball are, you know, certainly you know, not a fair thing. But normally, you know, it's, it's usually your first 50 picks are the majority of your Hall of Famers. 
So, you know, a team that's going to need a slugger or wants to draw people in is going to be probably a lower team and isn't going to want to give that up. I mean, the Jays already get uh, the 28th pick from the Indians for the signing of Encarnacion. You know, I, I don't think other team was really going to be that interested in signing a guy who has clear issues in the clubhouse anyway and bringing that into their own, uh, their own ballpark. Well, it's not quite as bad as all that. He's only 36, not 38. But, okay, I, I thought he was a little bit. I thought he was uh, near 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 thirty, like late thirty seven. So, okay, I had my age wrong on him. He'll he'll be turning thirty seven this year. Um, okay, Th- that, but, that's what I was seeing. I got you. Yeah. Yep. But realistically, that doesn't really change much. I mean, between thirty seven and thirty eight in baseball years is still pretty ancient. And for yeah. a guy who's, I mean, who's been seriously declining. Who, right. who seriously declined just over the last season, you're going to start to – this is going to be the year where he's either going to put up or he's going to shut up. And right. if he can't do the things that he did a couple of years ago, then I don't see the team exercising the option to keep him. So we'll see how that goes. I think that Batista is a guy who – is going to be in Toronto for as long as he plays baseball because no one else is going to want to deal with him. And unfortunately, I think that that might just be the 2017 season. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the contract is relatively team-friendly. It's not, not horrific, but it's still pretty high up there for a guy who is, um, you know, has that veteran status. On the bright side, you know, with, with once, once Bautista signed – we're kind of beginning to see the pieces fall into place when we're what about 14 or 15 days, maybe a little, maybe a little bit more out from pitchers and catchers reporting the Orioles re-sign hot free agent, biggest bat on the market. I think as far as the, the most power we saw last year, obviously Encarnacion was the biggest player, but Mark Trumbo re-signs with the Orioles. I was a little bit surprised in this. I mean, I think as time went on, it was beginning to make a more logical fit, but I don't think many people really saw the, the Orioles as being a piece that were going to jump in there and sign him. To me, it kind of came out of the blue, even though it makes a lot of sense once I, I kind of break it down. I, I see where they came from and, and why they went ahead and made the, you know, the re-sign. Well, the thing, about, the thing about Mark Trumbo, right, is that you expected – had he uh, had he been re-signed two years ago in some sort of maybe arbitration deal, then I think that he would have gotten a lot more money, right? But it's sort of it sort of hurt him the fall off that he had at the end of the season last year. I think so. I'm sorry, I'm having a little bit of difficulty. You good, Bill? Yeah, I'm just having some. Uh, I'm having some technical difficulties here. Yeah, our, I think both our, our laptops are we're kind of we're losing a little bit. But no, I mean I get what you're saying. You, you know, I mean you're going to see. I mean, you know, his biggest time to me still was when he was with the Angels, right? I mean, it was you know it was Trumbo Absolutely. and Trout, I and mean, that's what you always heard. And then he went to, to Arizona and kind of declined, and then had a great season in Baltimore. So you know, I mean, I mean clearly, you know, you're picking this guy up. You know, in the hope that he's going to continue to do what he did, in, you know, for the the early on time last year, eleven million per season. I mean, you know, I think it's worth it for for three years, and then by that time he's about thirty four, thirty five, right around where, where where Bautista is. Then you figure out if he's going to get a veteran deal or if he's got to move on and find you know you know new things to do in his career or, or, or step out of baseball. The, the problem is with Mark Trumbo, I think, is that. You you did always hear Trumbo Trout Trumbo Trout when you were when you were watching L.A. Um, and they were sort of surging in that 2012 2013 uh, those two thousand those seasons where they were where they were really picking up uh, making it to to postseason play and stuff like that. You you heard those two names in conjunction with each other. The problem is I really think that Mark Trumbo was the beneficiary of Mike Trout. I think that he benefited from playing, from hitting in the same lineup. I think that 
not being able to pitch around Trumbo because Mike Trout was looming in the wings meant that he got pitched to more, had more of an opportunity to put the bat on the ball, uh, benefited him greatly. But let's not forget that the guy's a career 251 hitter. He's not, uh, he's not ever really been the guy who is going to be your number four hitter. He's not a power guy. Last year he did hit a bunch of home runs, but that was the, really the only time he hit a bunch of home runs. Uh, he, had, he had 47 last year, which is, I mean, great. That's, if, he could do, if he could hit 47 home runs a year, sign the guy to $100 million contracts. But if you're going to get the, you know, 22, 25, 14, 9, 13, if you're going to get those numbers out of the guy as far as home runs, and he's supposed to be sort of your power guy, like he, that was his expectation going to Arizona, that was his expectation going to Seattle, and it just never materialized, I think that you really got to look at, at maybe, um, maybe this guy – benefited from being on a on a team with a guy who is obviously uh a cleanup guy obviously going to be the power hitter on the team in Mike Trout I I do but but I also think that that's where I think it's the reason why that we kind of saw him have a resurgence in Baltimore is you have Chris Davis you've got J.J. Hardy you got Adam Jones you have Manny Machado so you had guys that you really I mean you can kind of have a pretty solid, you know, five or you know, you know, four or five string of bats, and that included Matt Weeters, who I mean, you know, was a was a good catcher, uh, really, probably the, I mean, the best catcher uh, at least on the free agent market. You know, you know, didn't he's not necessarily going to be a huge bat, but he's really the last piece that we're waiting to see where he's going to go, and, and that really takes us into into that because the ironic thing is, of all things, with Matt Weeters is that there's still a possibility that the Orioles could make a, a shot at maybe re-signing Matt Wieters. I, you know, I think it would be a, one ter- a one-year deal as they already grabbed Wellington Castillo uh, from the Arizona Cardinals, or well, the, the Diamondbacks. I am in football mode because it is championship Sunday, baby. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I mean, you know, they pick him up from, from the uh, – Castillo from, from the Diamondbacks. And, you know, I mean uh, – Weeders is a you know he hit 308 one year he's a, he's a mid he's a, he's a 250s guy kind of like Trumbo you know so I mean you know it, they were decent pieces that could work off of each other so now we're hearing a couple of things where there's a a potential that the Orioles could do a one year deal with him and that would basically force him to split time with Castillo and also getting some bats at DH so. If you're only going to sign Weeders to a one-year deal, I don't see I don't see the benefit uh, because if you're going to have Trumbo back and Trumbo is going to DH more than he's going to end up playing in the field, to me Weeders kind of ends up just being a piece that's sitting there, kind of gaining dust. And maybe you look to trade him or trying to assign and trade mid-season it, you know, to a team that's either going to give you pieces to try and contend with the Red Sox or not. Um, you know, I, Mark DeRosa said he thought that Weeders would end up in. In, in Atlanta, the Braves just signed a one-year deal with uh, veteran catcher Kurt Suzuki, so that's not seeming as as viable anymore. It's coming down to what, what a lot of sources are saying is really between maybe the Cincinnati Reds, the Rockies, and the Angels. Now, he's not a power guy, so the Rockies is, is a great park for power guys, and the Angels, to me, is kind of just a place to go and die. <laughs> and let's be honest, we, we don't right. see anything there. I mean, none of these teams, you know, the Rockies probably out of the three gives him the best chance to contend, but then you're going to an NL West where, I mean, man, you're going to get smashed by two I don't, powerhouses. I don't know. Um, I, don't like the, I don't like a move to the Rockies because the Rockies have Tom Murphy. And, you know, he, he's, he's probably, as far as sort of rookie catchers go, he's probably one of the top 30 catchers in baseball. I mean, I'm not sure that you could make a convincing argument to me that there are 30 catchers in baseball better than him. And he's going to come up and he's got a backup guy who is a pitch framing specialist in Tony Walters. Who's going to, 
who's going to be there to back him up. So Weeders would come in and have to contend with two guys who are younger than him. And one of those two guys who in, in the long run is probably better. I don't like the Rockies as a move. I don't like the angels as a move. The angels also picked up a, a pitch framer to this, this off season in Martin Maldonado. Um, I think Carlos Perez is probably going to still get a chance in Los Angeles. So I don't think that Los Angeles is a great move. I don't think that Weeders is a great move for Los Angeles unless all you're trying to do is get those two guys to compete at a higher level for their jobs. But I think Perez is probably going to get his shot. Maldonado is going to get a shot. I mean, that's why they went out and got him. Um, To me, there's only really two places where he makes sense. That's the New York Mets, who have Travis Darnod at, uh, at, catcher, at catcher right now, and then Rene Rivera backing him up. I think that Weeders is a better catcher than both of them, and I think that it makes sense to uh, put Weeders in New York, to sign him to a deal. It, it's going to make Darnod play at a better, at a higher level. It's going to make him have to uh, split time, obviously, Darnod's going to get some starts, but it's going to make him play better. And then the Washington Naturals. I mean, the Washington Naturals are in a win-or-go-home mode at this point. So um, if, if they don't I mean, do and, something and they, soon, they need a win. Their, age, I mean, right, they, their aging stars yeah. are going to start timing out if they don't do something soon. And that's including guys like Max Scherzer. That's... And Derek Norris, in my opinion, who they went and got earlier in the offseason, is not the guy who's going to bring them that winning sort of spirit. I think that uh, I think that Weeders is a better choice for them. Sorry, you were saying? Uh, I, I yeah, I mean, uh, my biggest thing is that the the Nationals just need a just need a damn win. I mean, they they, they can't win in in free agency for trying. I mean, they even struck out. Time and time and time again. I mean, they need something to go right for them. Uh, you know, I, I think both both make sense. Um, you, you get the big three coming back off of uh, off of injury, which you know, I mean, it makes uh, at least to me, you know, the you know the the most sense. And uh, as Dan Plesak mentioned, well, was last week that you know, I mean, he, he even thinks that. The, there's a good possibility the Mets can win that division with the arms being healthy. The surgeries have went well. The uh, the recovery has went well. All the therapy has gone well. You know, you, you get a, you get a great catcher behind the plate to call pitches for those th- you know those three guys. You re you re-sign Cespedes. I, I think it makes sense. I just don't know payroll wise if they have the room to do it. I know that there has been some kind of odd explanation from the Nationals camp that their spring training facility that they're, that they're building now in South Florida could be uh, preventing them from signing weeders, although they're saying that they're mutually exclusive and one doesn't affect the other. So it's still really up in the air. I, I'm really curious to see where he goes because none of it makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, I, I like I said, you're we're about three weeks out. I don't know why in the hell he hasn't gone ahead and signed somewhere, isn't on a staff to go ahead and start preparing. But, you know, as always, guys, we'll keep you updated on, on, on where he goes when it finally happens. You will hear it here out of left field. You'll find it at OO Left Field on Twitter and out of left field hosted by Kristen Graham on Facebook. Now, I, I told you guys last week when uh, you were stuck with me while Chris was on vacation – that uh, you know, you know, we, we touched on the Padres, which there wasn't much to touch on, and, and kind of briefly on the Dodgers because you know, <laughs> fortunately for him, and kind of fortunately, uh, you know, I, I was going to be nice enough to, to to hold this down for him. It brings us into, and yes, it still pretty much follows the course of how we've been doing, but it brings us into two teams. We're going to hold off on the Rockies because we have Hunter Wendelstadt waiting to join us here in just a few minutes. But uh, we have the Giants and the Diamondbacks coming up in the NL West. Now, before we get into this, uh, Chris, I, I know that uh, while you were still kind of working hard and I had a chance to go to uh, the Diamond Resorts Invitational Golf Tournament, I also had a chance to ask Dan Plesak 
MLB Network his thoughts on the NL West and if the signing uh, or the re-signing of Justin Turner and Kenley Jansen was enough for the Diamond Bat or for the Dodgers. Take a listen. On the NL side, the Dodgers re-signed their hot corner third baseman Justin Turner and Kenley Jansen. Do they have what it takes to go ahead and stay on top of the NL West or the Giants come back after a horrible second half meltdown last season and supplant the Dodgers as NL West champs and go into the 2017 postseason hot and looking for revenge? I think the big thing with the Giants is they had a good team. Their bullpen was awful. They've been a big sign to bring in Mark Melanson. I like their everyday lineup. Hunter Pence, you would have to think, is going to be healthy. The question is going to be Buster Posey. You know, it seemed like the catching kind of took its toll on him. He's one of the best offensive players in the game, and we'll see if they're going to play him a little bit more at first base. Love their starting rotation. I think the team in the West to look out for, I think this is a year of the Diamondbacks. Shelby Miller has to be better this year. I think the Taiwan Walker, the trade they made with the Mariners, will go along with Zach Greinke. I wouldn't count out. I wouldn't count out the Diamondbacks. I think they're the sneaky team on paper right now. It looks like the Dodgers and the Giants, but don't count the Diamondbacks out. They're a pretty good team. And our thanks to Dan. Please thank again for taking time with us a couple of weekends ago. It was fantastic. So I'm going to go ahead and get the floor to you because I mean, I'll be honest. Your, you know, first thing you said is, is do I want to allow, you know, delusional people on the show? Now I am not at all saying that Dan, please sack is delusional, but I, I cannot say that I am on board with his idea that the Diamondbacks are a sleeper in the National League West. Uh, no. Uh, and I don't want to, I don't want to come off as saying that Dan Plesak is delusional either. I, I obviously all thanks to him for coming on, coming on, giving us a few minutes, giving us some, some, uh, some time in an interview, but I just don't see the Arizona Diamondbacks as a threat. They haven't done anything major in the offseason. They, they've signed Gregor Blanco to a minor league deal who is, uh, has been a great outfielder for the Giants for the past few years, helped them, helped them along on some of their World Series seasons 2012-2014. But you're talking about a Diamondbacks team who just lost an all-star caliber catcher to the, to the Orioles, and then – Early in the offseason, just in November, they turn around and they trade a guy who's one of the best hitters in the league, who in I mean, Gene Segura, yeah. who hit 319. Um, in fact, led the NL in hits last year. Right. He led the National League in hits, and his whole hit stat line is, is good 319 batting average, 368 on base, 499 slugging, and 203 hits. So he was. I know you don't. I know you're not a huge fan of WAR as a stat, but his 5.7 WAR lands him at number 19 overall as far as Baseball References uh, uh, calculation of WAR is concerned, and that's a big deal. And who did they get and the back? Crazy, and the crazy thing, Chris, he didn't even make the All Star team last year. Right. Well, but uh, then again, we're talking about a guy who played in the National League at a time when the Cubs' entire uh, infield made the starting line of the All-Star team. So I understand not making the All-Star team with that to contend with, but still, great hitter, great all-around player, goes to the Mariners, and they get back Taiwan Walker, who to call him a mediocre pitcher is almost offensive to mediocre pitchers. He's not a good pitcher. In fact, he was playing so in fact, dude, he was playing dude, so poorly. Dude, did you come poorly. back on the wrong side of California? What the? Holy, dear God! He was and, and we're talking. I mean, I mean, this, this is your home <laughs> state team. No, I'm talking about the Diamondbacks. Well, the Diamondbacks you live in Arizona. Colorado. This is your home state team. <laughs> I, I'm not from Arizona. I live in Arizona. Um, but Tywin Walker is not a good pitcher. We're talking about a guy who, in 2015, had a four five six ERA. 4-2-2 last year, played so poorly last year that he got sent down to the minor leagues. And then when he comes back, his like, first, second, first or second start back in, in Major League Baseball against the Los Angeles Angels, the guy gives up three jacks in the first inning uh, in, on route to getting knocked out after six runs in one inning. It, the problem is the guy has a fastball that doesn't move. He doesn't, uh, it doesn't break, it doesn't rise, 
It doesn't do anything but go straight at the top of the zone. It's, it's a jet, like you said, and I just don't think that Taiwan Walker and Kettle Martell are the guys who are going to help the Diamondbacks. And like Bobby Cox said, you know, you can time a jet. And that's really all that, all that Taiwan Walker has. And uh, Kettle Martell is not even a mediocre hitter. Um, so to think that the Diamondbacks are a sleeper after um, – yeah, sorry, Kettle Marte, after losing Gene Segura to trades for Taiwan Walker and Kettle Marte, and after losing their, their all-star caliber catcher uh, to free agency, I don't see it. Um, it's certainly not going to be Gregor Blanco that brings them up into, into contention. As much as I like Gregor Blanco, he's – a better defender than he is a hitter. Um, but speaking of Gregor Blanco and leaving the Giants in free agency, uh, the Giants have made some moves this year that I think were the right things to do. First and foremost, signing Mark Melanson, who fills that huge hole that they obviously had at closer last year with Santiago Garcia and even with, um, with Romero, uh, with uh, Romo. Uh, the Giants went 30 and 42 in the second half last season, Graham. I'll give you time to, to let that number sink in. It's, uh, it's pretty bad. But I know, I know you want to talk about, about Goldschmidt, Pollock, Peralta. Those guys, those guys for the Dimebacks are going to be are going to be pieces that, that, that have been Diamondbacks pieces. They're not going to help the Diamondbacks any more than they help the Diamondbacks to their, to their, well, well, last, no, no, nearly let me, last let me place just, in it. Well, let, let me just, I want to prep it. I, I get that point, but let me at least throw you this. Pollock didn't play last year, broke his elbow early. Okay, so he was out the entire year. So you, you already was a big bat in, uh, in center field and Peralta had, quite a, a down year from his, you know, you know, it was his best year in 2015. He hit 312 in 2015 with an 893 OPS. He was 150 points lower on his OPS and almost uh, and 60 points lower on his average. So to me, it, you know, I, I understand where Dan Plesak comes from. As he said, if Shelby Miller shows up, Taiwan Walker, I, I agree. I don't think he's anything special, but if there's a possibility with the changes that, that, that were made by the pitching coach in Seattle, if that helps him. And if Peralta can go back to his 2015 year and Pollock comes out strong, I see why he thinks there could be something there. I just don't – but I'm still with you. I don't see how they are going to be able to overtake the two powerhouses, the Dodgers and the Giants, who we're getting into now. And, and I disagree because um, you, look at what, you look at what he did in 2015. He hit 312, like you said. What did Goldie do in 2015? He won the batting title. At one point – uh, Goldschmidt was hitting over 400, and I'm talking about in the middle of the season. Um, so I don't I don't see how those two guys catching fire again is going to help them because they still managed a near bottom finish with those two guys hitting better than they've ever hit in their entire lives. So I don't see them as the keys to a sleeper in Arizona. So moving on to the Giants who do have an opportunity to finish at the top of their division. You know, it, it's amazing how, how smooth and crisp your transitions can be when we go into San Francisco. It amazes me. Like, like it, you know, they can be <laughs> rough and shoddy the entire year, but when it comes to Giants, baby, let's go. I, I'm ready to do – you're going you're gonna to get it to there, and it's going to stay there for as long as possible. Well, it might. Um, <laughs> as I said, the Giants signed Mark Melanson – who was one of the top three closers last year. He was one of the top three closers uh, in free agency in the off season. The Giants said they were going to go out and get one of the big three. They did that. Uh, unfortunately, to me was the Santiago, most important yeah. signing of, to me was the most important signing of free agency. And I'm not just saying, yeah, I mean, because of you, to me, that was the most important signing of every team because of how bad 
that bullpen was. They needed that anchor, and he is that piece for a very fair price. Right, right. And, and I've had people argue with me about how fair $60, $60 million is. But when you look at the other two of the big three going for 80-plus, I think that $65 million is, is an extremely fair price for three years. Um, but in addition to Mark Melanson, they're going to avoid op- arbitration with Eduardo Nunez, who's going to be their starting third baseman, which is, which is a hole that they have. Nunez, in my opinion, not the best fit at third base. He has issues with, with uh, making errors. Um, but they also avoid arbitration with a great young player named Connor Gillespie, who I think, given a couple of years to mature, is going to be a great third baseman for them. He's going to play behind Eduardo Nunez. He's going to get some starts. He's also going to uh, come in and pitch hit, which has, was a real strength from, for him last year. You'll know he hit that, uh, he hit that big three-run shot uh, against Juris Familia in, uh, in, in the so, in, in the wild card game. In the wild card game, sorry. My brain is not working right now. In the wild card game, after that great game, both Madison Bumgarner and Noah Syndergaard put in um, and then went four for four in their final game of the season, that sort of roller coaster six, five loss in game four of the NLDS against the Cubs. Uh, and he hit that huge eighth inning triple against uh, Arolda Chapman. First time he'd ever seen a pitch faster than 97 miles an hour. The second one he sees, he turns on for a triple uh, that ties the game up. And so I think that Connor Gillespie is going to be a good piece for them. Do I think that these signings, Connor Gillespie and uh, Eduardo Nunez, they avoid arbitration with Court George Contos, who I think is a great bullpen piece. Obviously, they are going to keep Will Smith, who is another great piece. But are those going to be the things that – put them over the hump. Uh, I think that Mark Melanson alone is going to go a long way towards them being able to finish at the top of this division. However, the Dodgers were not sleeping in the offseason. The Dodgers kept the pieces they needed to keep, and they signed, uh, and, and what I mean by that is they, they kept Kenley Jansen. And Kenley Jansen is a piece for the Dodgers who is going to make the National League West a really fun division to watch next season because you're going to have, hopefully, a healthy starting pitching lineup for the Giants that's not going to include guys like Matt Cain. <laughs> uh, but we'll have, uh, we'll have Will Smith. Um, you're going to have a... Uh, a hopefully healthy starting lineup for for the Dodgers, which we all know that the big piece there is going to be their their ace. But most importantly, you're not going to see, hopefully, with Mark Melanson in the full, in in the closer role, you're not going to see that sort of decline. To call it a decline, I know you're looking at me funny right now because to call it a decline on the part of Santiago Casilla last year is like calling Lombard street a hill. Uh, Lombard street is a mountain uh, and it's steep. And so was the fall that, uh, that they went, that they went through at the end of the season last year. So I think if you can get both of those teams healthy, the national league West is going to be the most exciting with the exception of maybe the American League East. Well, I, I had a lot to go with on that, and I, I think you pretty much took took the time for uh, for us both on that one. I mean, to me, you know, hey, Nunez... You offered me the floor, and I took it. <laughs> I didn't know I offered you a floor in the freaking mansion. I thought it was like, you know, like a little four-by-four four area rug. No, hey, I, had I, to mean, get my, I had to get my time in. You did a whole show last week. Well, that's true. That's, hey, that's that's because uh, well, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, hey, I, I'll take a whole show for having to go to the to the golf show. But hey, you know, the golf tournament. But 
the one thing I'll say is, is you're put on Nunez. I get the concern at the hot corner. It is. I mean, it's it's to me. I think the second hardest spot to play in the infield side from short side. Short side, I mean, you're going every which way, you know. But side, I mean, even sideways, you know. I mean, you're up, down, left, right. I mean, north, south, east, west, and you know, every other way in between on a compass. With Nunez, you know, yeah, you, you got to range the line, but if it's foul, then you know, at least you don't have to worry about it. But I think it was it's worth to, worthwhile to have him there because obviously you had to give up. The third, your third baseman from last year, but that brings in Matt Moore. To me, Matt Moore is going to be the key. Uh, I mean, we already know that, that Bumgarner and Cueto are going to be Bumgarner and Cueto. Let's just go ahead and let them go do their thing. They can go out to pasture, eat the grass, you know, throw every five days and just go ahead and, and notch a victory. Samarja is going to be Samarja. You've got to be worried about that. If you can get rid of him, you get rid of him. To me, Ty Black still makes a, a, a logical sense. And there was a discussion of him being on the trading block, which I didn't understand that. Uh, I think you have, you have a, a, you know, a good young kid who you can develop with a good pitching staff. You've got a bunch of veterans around there. If they're willing to take him under their wing and teach him, I think he could be a star. But Matt Moore coming over from Tampa, to me, it makes the most sense being there. You know, it, it, he's going to be the, the biggest piece to see if he can fit into that rotation in that three and four spot, depending on how Bochy wants to use him when he wants to flip him up and down. But that's the piece you want for consistency. Also, Buster Posey. How much more can he catch? Dan Plesak mentioned that. We saw him get moved quite a bit uh, the first last year. And when I went and saw them play, I think it was like our third or fourth show. You were in Italy, I think, actually, on our third show. And I had, had a chance to go see them uh, play the Rays uh, on an interleague matchup. And he actually was DHing. He wasn't even catching. So, you know, how much are we going to see Buster continue to catch? Are they going to start to move him out of that role? They just re-signed Brandon Belt. Belt's going to be there. He's going to be at first for the foreseeable future. So, you know, I think it'll be one of those when Belt wants a night off, move Posey there, you know, and, and then Hunter Pence. Hunter Pence, injuries have been an up-and-down thing for him. He is, to me, he is the heartbeat of that team. He's the crazy hair, crazy beard, crazy eyes, makes you just go, what in the hell is this guy in right field doing? But he is the heartbeat and the soul of that team. Posey may be the leader, but Pence is the vocal guy. And, right. I, and, and, and if Pence can stay healthy and you keep Posey, you know, kind of back on, you know, if he can bat more like he was middle of the year, not as cold as he started off last season, then you don't worry about kind of spinning your wheels. Uh, you know, I, I think the way they spun their tires to start off 2016, along with the poor bullpen kind of begat that horrific downturn after the All-Star break, uh, it's going to be a hell of a division. I'm not going to even come close to picking divisions yet. We can save that for another show. Um, I think that, uh, but it's going to be a I lot think of fun. That Buster Posey, I, I agree. Though, I, I agree what you, with what you say about Buster Posey. How how long can he continue to catch? He is he is feeling sort of the the remnants of that injury that he received in 2011 that put him out for the season, that broken leg. So how long can he really continue to sit behind the dish? But he can have an opportunity to play more often at first base with Brandon Belt because Brandon Belt can play the outfield. So if it gets to the point where Brandon, where Buster Posey needs to get out from behind the dish and play first base, remember that the Giants don't have a day-to-day left fielder after Angel Pagan left. With no Gregor Blanco, no Angel Pagan, you don't have a day-to-day guy in left field. So I think that Brandon Belt could fill that need on occasion and allow Buster Posey to get out from behind home plate and play first and, base. And God forbid Hunter Pence gets hurt, at least then, then you, maybe you can, move, you can kind of flex belt on the outfield a little bit. Same way that we've seen Joe Madden do with, you know, I mean, they're expecting Ben Zobris to be more of an outfielder than an infielder. It's kind of how he finished off last year and with Javier Baez, who, and we're going to get to the NL Central here in just a couple of weeks, uh, you know, as we kind of get ready for, for the start of spring training. So, you know, it's going to be a great division. We'll get into the Rockies uh, next week, and then that'll take us into – uh, the central divisions, and then, man, we're gonna, it's going to be baseball time. So, uh, you know, hopefully uh, going to be a lot of good stuff. And, guys, if you will just hang tight with us, we're going to be right back. Very excited to have Major League Baseball umpire Hunter Wendelstadt joining us. Hang tight. We'll be right back here on Out of Left Field. 
Okay, let's get right to it. Do you want an easy gift idea good all year round? Or maybe you just like to keep a steady supply of quality crafted micro brews delivered directly to your door. Either way, The Grueling Truth has a solution for you. Go to thegruelingtruth.net slash beer to learn how you can join up with the Craft Beer Club and get the best American beers you've never heard of sent direct to you or that beer drinker on your gift list. The Craft Beer Club discovers exceptional craft brews from around the country and delivers them direct to you or your gift recipient. Every selection is produced by independent microbrewers employing traditional ingredients and time-honored brewing methods. Best of all, with the Craft Beer Club, there is no membership fee, no obligation, and any subscription may be canceled at any time. Choose from monthly, bi-monthly, or quarterly to get the right amount of great beer to stock your fridge or someone else's. So help the grueling truth help you to fantastic beer year round visit the grueling truth.net slash beer and join the club the craft beer club u.s delivery addresses only please enjoy craft beer club products responsibly and welcome back to out of left field very honored to have major league baseball umpire hunter wendelstadt joining us today hunter uh, i know that you are in florida for uh, about the third week of school i believe how are you doing everything is going great graham how are you doing today Doing excellent. It's a pleasure to have you on. I, I, as an umpire myself, I've uh, I've been looking forward to uh, to this for the last couple of months. And uh, another colleague of yours, Ted Barrett, is right around the corner coming on. So so very very excited. And Chris, even as a as a player, I know he's been looking forward to it as well. Well, you know what? The main thing before we get started, I wanted to just tell you and Chris one thing. Uh, thank you so much for your service and being in the Army. I don't know how often you brag on yourself, but everybody listening should definitely give you a thought of thanks for the service you provide to us and keeping us safe. And and I'm blessed to have a job in umpiring, but I wouldn't have it with guys like you. Baseball might be your passion, but thank you for the service you provided for this great nation. Well, thank you very much, sir. We appreciate that. So since, since you, uh, since you just bragged on us there for a quick second, we want to turn around and, and brag on you guys. So, uh, obviously, I get to live in Florida, and I'm about equidistant between the two umpire schools for Major League Baseball. That's the Meyer League Baseball Umpire Training Academy in Vero Beach, and then your school up in Ormond Beach. So, for a lot of our listeners who don't know and think that, man, you know, I could do what these guys do all the time and, you know, think that you're just the worst thing on the planet and have no earthly idea what's actually happening, which is so far incorrect, give us kind of an idea of, of what school is really how guys can get involved, uh, you, you know, with school and, and, and just kind of what it takes for, for a guy like Adam Amari of, of one of the new four who got their call to work full-time in Major League Baseball this coming season. Well, you know what, uh, Chris and Graham, the first thing it takes is you have to have a dream. And I kind of feel like, like Walt Disney because the odds are definitely stacked against you. Very, very few people attend umpire school and make it through. But the very good positive news is we've never had a class where at least one of our students did not make it to the major league level. So the first thing you have to do is have a dream and a passion for baseball. Then you sign up, and it's a a four-and-a-half-week program. And its fundamental is day one, here's a baseball, here's a bat, there's a base. Baseball is a game played between two teams. And you build the foundation from the day one until now, we're in the third week, and we just started doing handling situations, how to deal with irate managers, uh, what happens when a beam ball war breaks out. So we've gone from here's a baseball to let's handle all the, the other crazy things that can happen on that beautiful field. Wow. Now, so I'm curious, I have a question you mentioned, about yeah, – I'm sorry, go ahead, Chris. Sorry, Graham. I have a question about um, – so when you, when you have students come in and you say – you have to start with a dream, and you have to realize the odds are stacked against you. Um, is what's the what's the graduation rate at your school? Well, basically, unless you don't attend class or unless you score below a sixty percent on the test, you're going to leave here with a diploma. Almost everybody graduates. It's, it's close right. to a hundred percent, but right. the thing about then, it is, you have to realize you're graduating at different levels because the one thing. Um, you know, my father was a Marine, and uh, the gentleman that owned the umpire school before my father, Al Summers, he was in the Army. And the one thing is they instilled some of the lessons they learned in the military uh, and, and umpiring kind of go hand in hand. And the major thing is you have to be honest with yourself. 
So there are students at this school right now where you can look out on the ball field, and their highest potential would be to work maybe Little League Baseball, whereas there are people that you think might actually make a great major league umpire. Some will fall in the middle and do high school or possibly college. And that's the thing at the very end of the program, we sit down individually with each student and give them an honest evaluation of where we believe their, their highest achievements could be in the profession of umpiring. Wow. Now, Hunter, something that you mentioned is the beanball thing, and this is something that, that I even I struggle with, and, and granted, I don't see it very often. I've seen it one time in high school, and, uh, and of course, the manager told me that, that I was wrong because he would, have, he would have told his pitcher to hit the player, which uh, right, right, right. he at least came back and told me after that actually, yeah, the kid hit him on purpose, and he, he benched the kid for, for being foolish. But for guys, a lot of guys, and what I've read is that it's almost better for guys who come in without any – umpiring experience because they don't have these preconceived notions or bad habits that they've picked up. But how do these guys really develop that, that, that feel for the game, that judgment in a time where things are happening? And it, it brings me back to Adam Amari last year with the, right after we had the, uh, the fight in Texas where, where Dan Iasonia and Dale Scott's crew handled that, I thought very well. Um, you know, and then we had the, the Machado fight where he charges the mound we get, a, we get a throw behind Chase Utley, and Adam Amari immediately ejects the star player for the Mets, and everyone's up in arms. And to me, I mean, you're, you've already had a precedent set the last two games. It made very good sense, but how do these guys begin to really – are they taught how to develop that, or is it just something that's really learned over time? Uh, it's learned over the tens of thousands of plays and pitches and situations that you have while you're in the minor leagues. That's If, if you're born today – and God's gift to umpiring, and, and you're placed on this planet to be a major league umpire, you're still going to be able to you know, go to med school and law school in the time it takes you to get to the big leagues. Best case scenario, your best case is seven years that you're working major league games. And then maybe if there was a job open, that's going to be your best case scenario, and, and usually it's longer than that. And uh, it, just, it, it takes instinct, and not everybody has it, and then – it's from the experience you gain throughout your time in the minor leagues, certain clues, certain things like that. Um, and, and brawls have kind of taken care of themselves. You know, the players will take care of themselves in baseball. And then when something goes crazy, it's kind of up to the umpires to sort it out. And now the owners and management want us to be a little more proactive because they have millions and millions of dollars on the line. So... You know, these guys are the best in the world. These ball players are great. They know, they know how to, you know, place a ball where they want it, and that includes sometimes having to retaliate for something they thought broke the unwritten rules of baseball or somebody showboating, and that's, that's all part of the game, and that's what makes the game fun, in my opinion. Now, I, so, something you had a chance to do two years ago that – I mean, very few will ever have the ability to, was to umpire in the World Series. And uh, you worked, I believe it was game four behind the plate in San Francisco. Um, and, and something that, that you mentioned in the MLB Network special, the third team, um, and it was actually shown, I mean, I mean, blatantly, was the relationship between the umpire and the catcher. A lot of people, you know, very many people think that that the umpire profession is, is much more antagonistic than it really is. Uh, it was something that, that pitcher, former pitcher Mark Mulder mentioned that, you know, it was very rarely that he, he wanted to say much. It was just, you know, if, if, if you missed one, you probably know you missed one. There's no point in trying to show you up. But you discussed how important that relationship is between the catcher and the umpire and how much of a really a tandem team those two players are. You know, what is that? that dialogue or that relationship like with these guys who after a while you I mean you kind of begin to know on a on a pretty good basis from the time you know I mean you're behind there for you know three four hours a night sometimes with with multiple close pitches being uh, you know being called that maybe they're asking you where it is or what happened or even stuff about your family yeah the, you know things have changed a whole lot from when I first got up to the major leagues um, back when you got to the major leagues you would get tested a little bit, and you'd get tested by everyone. You're the new face on the block, and um, they'd see the new young umpire come up, and they would you know, see how, how far they could get away with different things. And, and I think it's changed a little bit now. The game has kind of evolved that 
the time frame. If you're a young umpire getting up now, you've usually had most of the young catchers and things like that. So, you, so actually, some of the younger guys know the the younger catchers better than we do. And and I've always treated catchers the same way. Um, always introduce myself if I don't know them. Always just have a little talk, find out kind of what their personality is. And you have different catchers. Some just want to go out there and catch, and they don't say a word either way. They'll never ask about a pitch. They won't ask how you're doing. They just want to go do their job, and, and that's great. Then there's some catchers that will talk your ear off and, you know, want to ask about your family, and that's great. And I think there's umpires that are the same way. That Just because an umpire doesn't immediately address a catcher maybe like I do, it doesn't mean that that umpire is not a good person or, or a grouch for not talking to him. He just approaches his game situation a little bit differently. And and that's just what makes the world go round is different personalities. And I like to always let the catchers know I really appreciate what they do for me because uh, being one of the bigger guys, if those guys don't work hard for me, I'm going to get hit a whole heck of a lot. <laughs> I know that feeling. Now, Chris, you had, had we had talked um, – this week, and you had mentioned that you were curious, kind of about the the what it's like being, you know, kind of the new guy that gets hired. And I wanted to give you a chance to really to ask Hunter, kind of, you know, your 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 question about the four new guys and Adam Amari, Carlos Torres, Pat Hoberg, and uh, Gabe Morales, who were being hired into Major League Baseball this year. Right. I guess my question is, uh, and it kind of it kind of goes with the question that I asked earlier. Um, once these guys sort of come up and they start they start filling in um working in the majors and then um when they get that phone call that tells them hey we're going to offer you a full-time position in major league baseball what are these guys feeling right now i mean what is that feeling like when you get um when you get that call because i i i know I mean, I don't know personally. I wasn't in Major League Baseball. But I know what it's like to be successful as a player, to be drafted onto uh, successful teams and, and ask to play at a higher level um, as a player. But is it, the same, is it a similar feeling for umpires when they get that call saying, hey, you're going to be a Major League umpire? Oh, absolutely. It, 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 what it does is it justifies all the sacrifice that you've made or all the sacrifices that you've asked the, your loved ones that they've made because – uh, behind every umpire, there's another successful person that helped you get where you are. Whether it's your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, behind any successful umpire, there is someone very special that not only were you sacrificing by being on the road, by being gone all summer, by not making much money, um, someone on the other side was sacrificing too in some sort of way. And when you get that phone call, number one, you have a you just got a yes, and, and who doesn't like to hear the word yes when it's something you really want? You know, from the time you're born as a little kid and you ask for an ice cream, when the answer is yes, you're pretty excited. Well, now you've achieved the granddaddy of all ice creams. You have made it to the major leagues. You are at the top of your game. And finally, when they give you that, hey, we're taking you to the big leagues full time, there's no better feeling in the world. I mean, you have finally achieved that dream that you came to umpire school to try and get, and you've got it. Now, Hunter, the last thing before we, we let you go, and I'm curious, is obviously replay is, is clearly becoming um, a, a bigger part in the game. really was used for the first time in your World Series, most notably at the back end of that double play at first, um, I mean, where Eric Cooper – I mean, made a great safe call. I mean, we're talking it was out by less than probably a one thirty second of a second. I mean, you can't – the human eye can't, can't tell the difference there. It, this year, uh, I believe it was in Milwaukee and the Cubs were playing, and there was a, there was a call. You, you were the acting crew chief that day, and the replay came back. With, I think it was, a, it was a trap ball or a safe call. And Joe Madden comes out. And, and, and obviously, you guys – on the field, once it goes to New York, you have no control. So what is the dynamic like with managers who know that if they come out to argue a replay, granted, they can ask for maybe a quick explanation, but when they get frustrated at, at the replay ruling and they come out and then you end up having to, to eject them, what is that dynamic like? How, how, do you, how do you try and diffuse it? What do you try and do to kind of help to try and keep them in the game and not have to go to that level? 
Well, here's the thing. With, with, with that particular play, it was a very interesting case play for all of us because when, when the play occurred and, uh, you know, from Madden's point of view, and it was, a, it was kind of a weird play, it was on a, a throw from the third baseman uh, to Rizzo, and the ball was a short hop in the dirt, and the umpire called him safe, the batter runner for Milwaukee. And the Milwaukee club starts playing the replay on the board, and it was a sellout because Chicago is so close to Milwaukee. And there were 45,000 people in the stands, including the three other umpires, that believed the call was probably wrong. And we went over to the headset, and we got on the headset, and we're literally on the headset for maybe 20 seconds, at which point the replay center said, well, we're going to confirm that call of safe, at which point my exact words were, um, can you repeat that? You're saying you're going to confirm the call of safe. So yeah, we're confirming the call of safe, at which point I confirmed the call of safe. Madden came out. I said, Joe, you know that you're ejected already for coming out to argue this. Let me know how you want to play it. Joe and I have a very good relationship. He Obviously, he took the Cubs to win a World Series. That speaks for itself. And, and that was Joe's whole point. There are there are 50,000 people possibly in this ballpark, and one guy saw it wrong, and apparently New York saw it wrong. And I said, well, you know, I, I've got to go with what they tell me on the headset. Well, what they were showing, the angle Milwaukee was showing, they, did, they didn't have the other angle that the Cubs feed had, and it showed that Rizzo was off the bag by about six, seven inches. And the umpire, who had his angle that was right on top of it, to everybody else in the ballpark, that guy should have been called out. Didn't even look close. And on the replay they showed in the stadium, it could have been a bad situation, but that's where replay was perfect. And, and after they interviewed Madden at the end, he goes, you know what, I, they didn't show that angle up on the board, and, you know, good for them. They got it right. So I, I said I'd let you go, but, but you, you took me to one more spot that, that I, I, I want to know, and I promise I'll let, I'll let you go. And Chris and I have had – this discussion a lot of times, and I've read some some hilarious stories about this. But granted, we don't you don't get obviously the uh, the, the big arguments anymore. Um, it, it's really not as necessary because of the the use of replay. But when those happened, how many of those were them actually ripping you a new one, and how many of them were actually just them going off just for the sake of look? and they actually had maybe no gripe with your call whatsoever? I would say in probably 70 to 75% of the time, they honestly felt like we had made a mistake. Uh, and they're, you know, they're very passionate. They're the top athletes in the world, the top managers in the world. And they really felt like we had you know, hurt their team, and they come out very passionate about it. Um, the other times, there, there are different triggers. They want to fire up their team. Uh, someone's been slumping, so they're going to stick up for them. You know, Bobby Cox would never try and let one of his players get ejected. He would always take the fall for his players. And what people didn't know about Bobby Cox is he was, his, he was one of the greatest guys off the field. You would love to sit down and talk baseball and uh, one of the most wonderful people off the field. And on the field, everybody wanted to play for him because he was that type of manager that he would not let you take the fall. He would always try and keep you in the game. Um, with Bobby, though, if he got ejected and you lied to him, Bobby was very strict. He would have young players come up and apologize and you know, to the umpire and say, you know, I'm sorry that I did that. I'm sorry that I got Bobby out. On it. Uh, Bobby was a no-nonsense when it came to that. He led the all-time record in ejections, but for people would say, oh, he's just unfair. No, Bobby Cox was, was very fair, in my opinion. And then you have a guy, Phil Gardner. Here's a guy that I grew up watching, you know, scrap iron and um, umpiring as a young umpire in the big leagues, and he is really struggling. His team is struggling, and he comes out to get ejected. And I just said, Phil, I'm not, I'm not throwing you out of this ball game. And he goes, no, Hunter, you're going to throw me out of this game. I said, I, you know what, I, I can't throw you out of this game. I just, you're, I'm respectful of you as a player. You've always been great as a manager. And then, Phil decided to drop some of the magic words with a big smile on his face, and and I had to throw him out. And he goes, "I told you you were going to throw me out." I told you you were going to throw me out, and he turned and walked away. And it was just, um, you know, it, it, it. And and if they all were like that, it would be it would be great. Unfortunately, at the time the arguments going on, most of them, 
uh, you know, they're kind of nerve-wracking because we always try or want to be right, and there's no worse feeling um, than to be wrong. And now as an umpire, it's great because you get that you're still very upset. If you go to replay and they overturn the call, just because you have that competitive spirit, it's very upsetting to miss a call. But the good news is if you have a call in the first inning five, six years ago, it would be on your mind all game until you could run right in off the field and watch that play to see if you got it right or got it wrong. Now you have that instant gratification. They're looking, they're looking, they're holding up, and then they say go ahead and play, and you're like, oh, yeah, I got that one right. And then the problem is nowadays when they motion to go to the headset, <laughs> they're really dialing in, they're getting better at it, and then you know you're probably going to have to overturn it. But you, you get the instant answer to whether you're right or wrong, and that goes back to being honest with yourself. So I have, I have one last question, and I know this isn't really something I prepared with, with Graham previously, but it's something that we asked um, Jerry Davis when he was on, and I kind of just want to get a consensus. This is something we talked about, uh, oh, pretty early on in the show, and it's about how, um, about how officiate, officials um, handle situations with pitchers possibly having foreign substances. And uh, we discussed it with Jerry Davis because he was involved in the situation uh, where he had to eject a player for a foreign substance. And so my question is, um, do you think it would be beneficial for Major League Baseball to look at possibly coming up with some sort of tacky substance that pitchers could legally use to make it safer to play in cold weather? Chris, were you a pitcher? Uh, no, I was a first baseman. I didn't. <laughs> okay, I, just, I was just wondering. That's usually a question you get from a pit, uh, pitcher. Um, my my personal opinion is this: uh, me not being a pitcher, I I used to when I was playing in high school, I was a catcher, first baseman, or outfielder. Um, I just know how good these major league pitchers are, and I know once you open that Pandora's box, you run into a very big problem. What substances are going to be le- legal? What kind of tact? Does it have to be tacked? What if there is, uh, you know, what's the difference between pine tar and what's the difference between uh, Vaseline? One guy's going to say that Vaseline he makes his, you know, fingers feel better because they were dry. I, I don't know where you stop. Once you, once you open up that can of worms, where do you stop from there? What I do know is that the rule is he's not allowed to have foreign substance. So as long right. as the rule is there, then we're going to enforce the rule. And, you know, the penalties that, that the player acquires for having said foreign substance is, is how we're going to have to play it right now. Um, like I told you earlier, once again, 245 Park Avenue, they signed my paycheck. Uh, if they want the guy to have a glob of um, pine tar or a glob of, uh, you know, <laughs> drywall, it, it doesn't matter to me. Whatever, it, If they are allowed to have it, they can have it, and that's up to them. But for right now, if there's a foreign substance, I'm going to have to do everything that I've been taught to do to enforce that particular rule. Right. Well, well I, I, I thank you very much for coming on. And, Chris, I, I want to say as well, since I didn't say this before we got on, uh, a happy birthday to you as well. Uh, you're getting very, very old and ancient and decrepit, but I still wish you a happy birthday today with, uh, with your family. Happy birthday, <laughs> Chris. It. And then if everyone else in the audience doesn't know, Graham's getting married, so uh, he's getting married <laughs> later in the year. So all you ladies, sorry about that. That's right. And I'll be there. I'm actually Graham's best man, believe it or not. He likes me that much. Yeah, he may not act cool. like it, but he does. <laughs> Pick, well, the fear pickings were slim. All right, oh. guys. Well, th- thanks a lot, and um, I'll talk to you guys real soon, hopefully. Thank That's you very great. much, Hunter. Hunter, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. It was an absolute honor for us to have you on. Absolutely. We couldn't appreciate it more. Uh, it's always great to get the position and uh, the point of view of a major league umpire. And, guys, we really appreciate you joining us here again on Out of Left Field for another show. It's been a really great time uh, doing these shows for you guys. We're glad you guys tune in and listen every week. And we can't wait to be back next week with more stories straight out of Left Field.